doing the machine design stuff, as we're going to be seeing. Uh, we've been leading up to it with some, um, some of our previous discussions. We're going to be talking about springs, gears, clutches, brakes, gear trains, gearboxes, pressure vessels, all kinds of good stuff like that over the next several days. Um, also fasteners and welds and so forth. Uh, we'll probably be doing, I'm, I am going to follow along with the curriculum fairly closely. Uh, that said, there will be probably a little bit of wandering around between the topics as I feel is appropriate, uh, just as I think some things might uh, help with understanding of, of the overall subject matter if we change perhaps the order of presentation. Uh, so that said, you know, when you're doing your homeworks, if you feel like there's something we haven't covered yet uh, and you want to, you know, wait on that, certainly feel free to, to approach it in that way. Okay. Uh, before we get into tonight's discussion, I want to just uh, close the loop on something that came up during the office hours. This is uh, mechanical engineering practice problem 60-1. It was one of the vibration problems. And in the course of going through this vibrations problem, I'm just going to briefly review this one over here. Uh, what we were essentially doing was we had a shaft. Uh, there's two bearings out here that aren't pictured. One's over here and one's over here. This bearing is rotating. And we, we were tasked with determining what the critical speed of the bearing was based on the fact that there were two disks of different masses located as shown on the disks. Um, in order to make that calculation, which is um, outlined, uh, the procedures outlined in the reference manual on how to do this, we need to calculate what the deflections are at the 100 pound and the 75 pound mass. And that was going to be done simply using the beam tables and applying the principle of superposition. So in the big picture view, what we're going to do is we have the shaft that would deflect as such. And we'd have a 100 pound load over here. And we're going to de determine the deflection at this point, And then also the deflection over at this point due to the 100 pound load. And after that happens, we will go through, and I'll sketch in another color. We'll put a 75 pound load and add it on over here. And then determine the deflection underneath the 75 pound load and also at the location of the 100 pound load. And essentially add the two of those together to find what the total deflection is at each of those points and then follow through with the procedure that's outlined. Well, it was this intermediate calculation that got a little bit confusing and it was a little tough to. Uh, to Unwind, I should say, as I was trying to think on my feet is exactly what they were doing. So as promised, what I did was I went back through and made a little more bit of an organized calculation and lay that out for you guys, which is now located in the forums. Uh, it looks like the bottom of my calculation is cut off, though. I don't know why that is here. Let's see. Oh, I can pan around. All right, good. So the uh, what we do is we take a case from the um, appendix where we have a load, one single point load that's applied, and we're going to calculate the effect of that point load both underneath this point of application and then at the location of where the other load happens to be located. And we're going to do that twice, once for the 100 pound load and then once for the 75 pound load. So depending on where we're looking, we need to use different um, formulations of the deflection calculation. So the one that's circled over here in red, I'll start with that. That is, if you want to know what the deflection is, immediately under the applied load. So right under here, we use this equation in red. That one is pretty easy. It's what happens when we move away from it and we want to make the calculation that the equations become a little bit more difficult to work with. So you'll notice over here, if we remember from the calculations that let's say in the first case, we had a hundred pound load where P is, and then there was a 75 pound load off to the side. That 75 pound load is located to the right. So everything in my calculations that I've done was I referenced it from the left hand end. I just felt that keep, kept things better organized. So looking from the left hand side, the, our point of interest is past P. Since it's past P, it's at a location over here such that X is greater than A. We need to use this version of the deflection calculation. Likewise, 
when we're looking at the 75 pound load and we want to determine what the deflection is at the location of the 100 pound load, we're doing it now at a location where X is less than A because now the definition of A is changed. Remember, A tells you how far the force is from the left end. So as a result, we use a different formulation for that equation here. I made a table describing how all of that goes. And what I did within this table as well was to try to keep everything organized was I color coded the way the deflections were calculated down at the bottom with the the color of the circles that I circled each equation in to hopefully make that a little bit easier to follow. So I just want to make sure everybody picked up on that as well. So the red circled equation is used to de derive the red answers. The blue one goes with the blue answer and the green goes with the green answer. And with that, you should... Uh,